Hi everyone, welcome back. We're back for another season of Once Upon a Time. Thank you so much for your support on seasons one and two. If you're new and you don't know what's going on, my name's Ava and I do recaps of the ABC slash ABC family hit television show Once Upon a Time that ran from 2011 to 2017. And we are on season 3A. If you want to catch up, um, season 1 and 2 will be linked below. Um, I've heard I have a podcast-like voice. That's, what, that's the feedback I've been getting. So feel free to listen to it like a podcast or watch it or whatever. We're doing season 3A. So something interesting that the writers, Edward and Adam, did was splitting up some of the later seasons. If not all, I'm actually not sure if all of them are like this. I know, not an expert, into they split the seasons up into two parts. So we have season 3A, we'll also have season 3B. Why am I only doing season 3A? Well, it came at a great time because it is my winter break. Yes, I'm a college student. So 3A, which is half the season, half the work, um, was a lot more manageable and I wanted to get a video out to you guys while I could and while I kind of had the free time and wasn't working on my undergrad thesis that is looming over my head. So that's why um, the video will be shorter. I hope, I hope we can live with that in our hearts. Um, it makes me kind of sad because I love the long videos. I think it's a really fun challenge for me. I think people out there, you guys on the internet enjoy it too. Um, it's just not feasible sometimes. So we're gonna start with season 3A and see what comes next. Please leave a comment below. People are analyzing the shit out of this show in the comments and it's so funny. I love the literary analysis. I love the psychoanalytical takes on relationships. It's so much fun. So feel free to leave a comment below. I am loving the energy. Timelines are gonna be wild. I don't even think I'm gonna try and give you a starter to explain. But basically our heroes are in Neverland. Um, we have some people in the Enchanted Forest. We'll also have flashbacks to Neverland in the Enchanted Forest and Storybrooke. It's just gonna be a wild time. If, if you've seen the other two videos, you're well versed, you're trained for this. If you haven't seen the other two videos, it's okay. We'll figure it out as we go. But for the veterans who are coming back, you, you guys are trained, you guys know what to do. Okay, a little recap. Our family tree is happening. We have our main characters in the middle. Um, the pink tape means they are in love with someone or they've been engaged to someone or they've kissed someone and it's gonna lead to love or something i i don't i don't make the rules so that's pink tape purple tape is familial relations so you see this it means um they're the parents um some of this is a little out of order she's her stepmother if you know you know yeah fathers parents we have three symbols that are incredibly important rumpelstiltskin's dagger that controls him that controls all his power we have the storybook that kind of was what told Henry that all of these characters were fairy tale characters. And we also have the curse that brought everyone from the Enchanted Forest to Storybrooke the first time. Because it's going to happen more than once. Spoiler alert. I think that's it. I think now we're ready to dive in. Season 3A, Episode 1, Heart of the Truest Believer. First scene, trigger warning for, I guess, birth trauma, because it's a traumatic scene. 11 years ago, in a Phoenix, Arizona prison, Emma Swan is giving birth. So, traumatic scene. She's screaming. It's not looking good. She has Henry, but she refuses to look at him or hold him because, quote, she can't be a mother. She doesn't believe she can be a mother. Full body chills during this scene. She's sobbing. She never holds Henry, and that's all we see of that for now. We flash forward to the present time where our heroes are on the Jolly Roger. Remember, they are taking Hook's ship called the Jolly Roger to Neverland, and they went through a portal that was opened by a magic bean. Imagine, imagine saying that to a Victorian child. Imagine saying that sentence. So they are going to Neverland. We have on the ship crew, we have Emma, we have David, aka Prince Charming, we have Mary Margaret, aka Princess Snow White, <laughs> we have Captain Hook, we have Rumpelstiltskin, Mr. Gold, the Dark One, the Crocodile, blah, blah, blah. Um, we also have Regina, the Evil Queen, and I, I think that's it. They are going after Henry, who's been kidnapped by Greg and Tamara and brought to Neverland. 
all of our heroes are ready for their next adventure. Emma is mourning the loss of Neil. So in the last season, at the very end, he got shot and fell through a portal. So everyone thinks he's dead. Spoiler alert, he's not. We know this from the last season. He washed up on shore. We'll get to it in a minute. But Snow and David are trying to help Emma get through this loss of Neil and Henry, but she's feeling resentful and disillusioned because what happened to good always wins. So far, it's just been bad thing after bad thing after bad thing after she's broken the curse. She broke the curse in season one and everything should have been over, right? Well, they said we can make more money off this show, so we're putting them through trauma. Gold ditches the Jolly Roger. Um, he tur he changes into a Rumpelstiltskin outfit and then ditches the Jolly Roger because he doesn't think that Emma has the capability to save Henry. He doesn't think that she has what it takes to believe in herself, believe in her own magic, and really take a leap of faith in order to save Henry, whatever that means. Then the ship is attacked by mermaids who summon a magical storm. Uh, everyone starts fighting amongst one another because of course Snow never wants to kill anyone or torture anyone, but Regina wants to kill the mermaid and torture the mermaid and get the mermaid to stop. And it's just a whole thing. And Emma's trying to get everyone to stop fighting so they can work together because she realizes all of the infighting happening with our crew is what's making the storm worse, magic. So Emma realizes it's all of the infighting on the ship that's causing the storm. So she throws herself overboard to get everyone to stop fighting. It works, uh, she gets knocked out because she's in a churning ocean, but David saves her. Yay, everyone's all right and everyone stops fighting so the storm breaks. Meanwhile, Greg and Tamara roll up to Neverland with a kidnapped Henry. Henry is not happy and he's like, my moms are coming to get me, both of them, which, Family time, family time, exciting. Greg and Tamara reveal that they are set out to destroy magic because magic only hurts everyone. Remember, magic killed Greg's father, all of this stuff. They are in Neverland to do this, I guess, and they're trying to communicate with their home office. They've got a walkie-talkie that can help them communicate with the home office, but it's full of sand, like there's no batteries in it. And so Henry's like, are you sure? you know what you're doing and they're like yes we listen to the home office and we listen to our bosses and we know exactly what we're doing but it's not looking good for greg and tamara they build a fire to alert the home office but it actually only alerts the lost boys and the leader of the lost boys felix so we saw the lost boys last season but now they're really going on the board so this is felix last season i said he looked like jamie campbell bauer I, I, I think the more I looked at him this season, the less he looked like Jamie Campbell Bauer. But nevertheless, I did call him a Jamie Campbell Bauer lookalike. I couldn't find a photo of the Lost Boys that didn't look deeply dark and like it would show up badly on camera. So um, they're gonna, we're going with the Disney version. <laughs> um, so the Lost Boys reveal that they are the home office. So Greg and Tamara have been fooled by the Lost Boys, and by extension, Peter Pan, who we'll get to. So the Lost Boys kill Greg and gravely injure Tamara. Henry tries to run away, and he is saved by a different boy, who also says he's running from the Lost Boys. Henry and this mysterious boy use pixie dust to fly away from the Lost Boys. Now, pixie dust is important because it can help you fly but you can only fly if you believe in yourself and believe in magic. That's gonna be a whole thing. If you've seen Disney's Peter Pan, I do believe in fairies, I do, it's a whole thing. So yeah, so Henry can fly, which means that he is very special. He has the heart of the truest believer. Henry and mysterious boy land and think they're safe up until the moment that the mysterious boy starts being a little evil and looks at him darkly and reveals that he is Peter Pan. So we have the main antagonist of this season, Peter Pan. Now he is one of he is one of our special boys. The fandom, the fandom loves this man. People want this man very much so. He he's he's one of the ones that people adore. He's a fan favorite, he's a hottie. We love this man. I can't remember the actor's name. My brain is going Robbie Coltrane, but I, I think that's Hagrid from Harry Potter. And I, 
don't remember this man's name. I think it's Robbie something though, but he, people want this man. They do. Okay, so Pan had tricked Greg and Tamara into bringing Henry to Neverland. Pan wants the heart of the truest believer, and that is Henry. Remember, this was foretold a while ago when young Neil was in Neverland. Pan had a picture of Henry and knew that Henry was the heart of the truest believer. That was before Henry was even born, because his son, because his father was a child, Henry could not have been born. This has been foretold. This is a prophecy. Gold, who has gone rogue, finds Tamara, who's gravely injured, and she reveals that Pan wants Henry. He kills her. So, Tamara interlude, because not to get on my soapbox, but we're looking at another black character in this show who is a villain and dead and isn't even allowed a shot at redemption like so many other villains are over and over again. I can recognize a pattern. It's not looking good. This show does not treat its black characters well, uh, as we know from Sydney Glass, as we know from characters who didn't even make it on the board because they didn't make it past one episode. So it's just not looking good. I was watching a video by Princess Meeks who points out um, sort of a phenomenon or not even a phenomenon, like a repetitive pattern in um, fantasy and sci-fi especially, I was watching a video called Martha Jones Deserved Better and Other Correct Doctor Who Takes, because um, I've been in my Doctor Who era. Not that that matters, but <laughs> she talks about how black characters are often used um, as like stepping stones and or an obstacle in between like the main love interest between the two white people. So Tamara was introduced as Neil's fiance, um, she was kind of introduced as Emma's like romantic rival and now she's been killed and now that she's killed the two white leads can get together It's a pattern. She points it out in Doctor Who as well It's just it's not looking good and it's something I want to point out even though this is like a fun fantasy magical show everyone gets a happy ending Unless you're not white. It's just not looking good. So that was my Tamara interlude. She deserved better. Yeah, that's, a, that's what I gotta say. So, Gold clearly knows the Lost Boys, but very antagonistically. The Lost Boys make it clear that if Gold goes against Pan and to look for Henry, he is Pan's enemy. Um, the head Lost Boy, Felix, gives Gold a little homemade doll saying, Pan wanted you to have this. And Gold takes the doll and starts crying. Back in the Enchanted Forest, in the present, so in this same timeline, we're just in a different world, Neil has fallen into, I guess washed up on shore of the Enchanted Forest, and he was found by Mulan, Aurora, and Philip. This happened last season. So, he wakes up. Mulan, Aurora, and Philip, our favorite thruple, have healed his bullet wound, so he's actually fine. He's not dead. Aurora thinks that she can help him make contact with Henry and Snow through her fire dreams from season two, but um, they can't. She can't make contact. But Neil, so Neil thinks if he goes to his father's castle, Rumpelstiltskin's castle, he can find a way back. They arrive at the castle, and guess who's there? Robin Hood. Oh dear, he's gonna go right here. Rob, oh, oh no. Yeah, yeah. Robin Hood also has a son. Robin Hood's son is named Roland. He is three years old. Neil points out that Robin Hood owes Rumpel a life debt. So remember in season two when Rumpel set out to kill Robin Hood and Belle convinced him not to? So apparently now that means Robin Hood owes Neil and Rumpel a life debt. I also don't know how Neil knows this. Because this was after, way after Neil left. I don't know. I'm not sure. Neil has Robin Hood help him look around the castle and they find a secret door. And inside the secret door, there is a crystal ball he uses to look into. And he, in the crystal ball, he sees that Emma is in Neverland. He knows this is not good. <laughs> Season 3A, Episode 2, Lost Girl. So, in Neverland, Gold cuts off his own shadow, because that's something we can do now, um, and instructs his shadow to hide the Dark One dagger so that Pan can't get to it. Then, someone steals the doll Pan gave him, and when he goes to accost the thief, it's Belle. He realizes that it's not actually her, it's just sort of a vision he's conjured up, and the real Belle is safe in Storybrooke. So this Belle, this fake Belle, 
is um, Rumpel's therapist while he is in Neverland. So they do a little therapy session where he realizes he's worried that he's going to make the selfish choice. So basically, to, to run this back really fast, he knows this prophecy that Henry will be his undoing. Got it? So the old selfish Rumpelstiltskin would have killed Henry in order to save himself. But because he thinks Neil is dead, he still wants redemption, like he wants to redeem himself, even though Neil's dead, I'm not really sure. So he wants to save Henry and sacrifice himself. That is his heroic goal here in Neverland. Gold reveals that the doll is the last thing his father gave him before his father left him, and he throws the doll away. But then fast forward to the end of the episode, the doll comes back. So he burns the doll and the doll comes back. And it just keeps coming back, forcing him to keep the doll. Meanwhile, Hook is leading our heroes through Neverland, telling them Neverland's secrets, including Dream Shade, a poisonous thorn that if you get pricked by it, you die. Write that down. They make camp and Emma wakes up to the sound of children crying. Pan poofs in and introduces himself to his new guests on Neverland. He wants to see what he's up against. He reveals that only she can hear the children crying because she was once an orphan, if that makes sense, because this is kind of the island of orphaned children. That's gonna come up a lot. He gives her a map that will lead them all to Henry, which is sus because he is a villain. The map is actually blank, and he says she'll be able to read the map when she stops denying who she is. They can't get the map to work, so Regina tracks Henry with a locator spell on the map. So they can't actually read the map, but they follow it. We use locator spells a lot in this show. It leads them to the dark jungle. In the dark jungle, they are ambushed by all of the lost boys, who, by the way, do not look like this. They are, like, armed and deadly and the heroes have to fight their way out of this ambush. Back in the enchanted forest, in the past, okay, we flash back to the way, 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 way beginning, one of the first, I think the first scene of the whole show, where Charming is riding like hell to save Snow White and he kisses her and she wakes up. We know this scene. Then we switch to seeing this scene through the mirror, AKA Sydney Glass, AKA Mirror Mirror on the Wall, the genie who's stuck in the mirror. If you remember season one, you remember this plot. And Regina is watching, where is she? Regina is watching this all go down. We then see Snow and Charming trying to rally the extras. They're in some village with all the extras of the show, AKA the villagers. And they're trying to rally the extras to defeat the evil queen. Regina crashes this rally and offers them a deal. If Snow gives up her claim to the throne, Regina will let these two go and she'll also stop killing innocents, because that's what she's been doing. Snow thinks they have to take Regina's deal because she doesn't think that she can defeat Regina. So David doesn't know what to do, so guess who he goes to? Guess? It's gonna be hard. It's hard to know Rumpelstiltskin. David goes to Rumpelstiltskin. Rumpel is like, you could defeat the evil queen with a magical sword named Excalibur. If you're familiar with Arthurian legends, Excalibur is, I think is King Arthur's sword from Camelot and you pull it out of the stone and then you're the chosen one. I'm not sure because you know what? I've never seen Merlin, which is very off brand for me. I've seen the first episode of Merlin and I never, I, I just think that's off brand. Like it seems like a show I would have watched. I've seen Avalon High. Some of you appreciated that reference last video, but I've never seen Merlin. Anyway, Charming, allegedly, helps Snow find Excalibur and she pulls it out of the stone and she is like, I'm the chosen one, I can defeat Regina. So when she goes back to the village with all the extras and the villagers, Regina pops up and she, I guess like slices, like she draws first blood with Excalibur and she's like, ha ha ha, we can defeat Regina. Um, so then the 20 extras in the scene side with Snow. So they're like building up their army against the evil queen that will eventually overtake Regina. This particular plot line is told very out of order and then the writers go back and like adjust it and fix things. So it's very, it's a convoluted plot of when Snow wakes up and when they defeat the evil queen and when the storybrook curse comes, all this stuff. Snow then seeks out Rumpelstiltskin. I can't remember why, she just does. And he reveals that the sword isn't actually Excalibur and Charming just pretended 
it was so that Snow would believe in herself. So that's good, I guess. But now we know that Snow can defeat the evil queen all on her own. Back in Neverland, Emma is conflicted about this blank map because she can't get it to work because she needs to embrace who she is. Luckily, they'd fought all of these despondent looking lost boys, all of these like orphan lost boys who clearly didn't even want to be fighting for Pan but kind of had no other choice. And she recognized this kind of look in their eye, this like sadness and despondency. And she really resonated with that because of her time in the foster care system. She doesn't feel like a hero or a savior. She feels like an orphan. In fact, she feels like a lost girl. When she admits that out loud, the map works, and now she can see where Henry is. Pan rolls up and he's like, oh, by the way, he's British. I feel like that's, I feel like I need to stop talking about accents in this show, especially because me, I have like the most horrendous like Midwestern accent too, so I shouldn't even be talking. I'm from Michigan, I have the Michigan mumble, but I think I'm just gonna keep talking about accents and keep getting canceled. So he's like, by the way, <laughs> So Pan is like, by the way, I know you haven't forgiven your parents for abandoning you. And he's like, just like Henry won't forgive you either when you're not able to save him. And then he'll never want to leave the island. And then he threatens to kill her parents and then he leaves. So he, he really rolls up, he stirs up, he stirs the pot, he stirs up the drama, and then he gets the hell out of there. So at the end of the episode, it's revealed that during the fight with the Lost Boys, David got scratched with the poison. They they tip the uh, their arrows with the dream shade poison and David got scratched by that and he is dying. Season 3, episode 3, quite a common fairy. So in Neverland, the heroes are trekking through the forest on their way to Pan's camp, but the camp keeps moving on the map, which isn't good, which means Pan is moving their camp to mess with them and their camp is where they're keeping Henry. Hook says they need to find a fairy to help them find the camp. Guess who this fairy is? None other than Tinkerbell herself. Can you see that? So this is Tinkerbell, but Regina is insisting that Tinkerbell will not help them. Back in the enchanted forest in the present, Neil, Mulan, and Robin Hood are looking for a way to get to Emma. Robin introduces his band of merry men, including his three-year-old son, Roland. So the merry men, if you don't know the Robin Hood legends, they're these men that I guess follow Robin Hood around. Like they're just kind of his like group, his friend group, his group of guys. Neil gets an idea to use three-year-old Roland as bait for Pan's shadow. Remember Pan's shadow goes around the world and kidnaps little boys and brings them to Neverland. So, uh, but instead of the shadow taking Roland, Neil will grab on and go to Neverland with the shadow. Robin doesn't want to do this because he just lost his wife if you remember in the episode where they decide not to kill him, Maid Marian was sick at the time and since having Roland she has died, so that's not good. Um, he doesn't want to lose another member of his family, understandable. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, so that was the present time, now we're in the past. We're in the era where Regina is taking magic lessons with Rumpel. She's not yet the evil queen. Though she is the queen, she is married to um, Snow White's father. Snow White is probably a younger girl at this time. Like it's kind of in there pre uh, he died. When, how did he die? When did he die? Did he die? I don't remember him dying. Maybe he'll die later. This family tree. Okay, anyway. She is taking lessons with Rumpel, but she doesn't want to end up evil like Rumpel. Essentially, she's longing for freedom. How do I explain this? She goes to her balcony and she just kind of rages. She's very angry and then she falls off the balcony to her death, presumably. But she is caught by Tinkerbell who like catches her and sets her on the ground. And she's like, I can give you a second chance. So Tink and Regina, they kind of become besties and they start spilling the tea and Regina complains about how Snow had her fiance killed and she is the queen, but she is the queen of nothing. She has no actual power. Tink is adamant that to turn her life around, Regina needs to find her true love. Tink says they can use pixie dust to find Regina's true love. Back in Neverland, we see Tink tracking our crew. She's watching them from the brush. 
Meanwhile, Regina convinces Emma that her and, if her and Emma use their magic together, they can overpower Pan. But Emma doesn't want to do this because, say it with me, all magic comes with a price. It's very obvious that Regina is doing everything she can not to find Tink, and so finally Emma is like, what did you do to her? Like, you had to have done something to, to her. It's always you. Why, when any, anything happens, it's always you too. Meanwhile, Hook has caught on that David has been poisoned by Dreamshade and it's not looking good. Yeah, <laughs> that's about it. Put a pin in that. Meanwhile, Pan and the Lost Boys have decided to uh, psychologically torment Henry by making him shoot an apple off of Felix's head. Henry is a hero though and he tries to shoot Pan instead, but Pan does the thing where he catches the arrow right before it hits him. It's like a classic Rumpelstiltskin move. Rumpel does that a lot when he's being shot at. He catches it. Pan does the same thing. So, uh, not looking good. We can't destroy Pan. Back in the Enchanted Forest in the past, Tink flies to, I wrote Neverland, but that's not right. Tink flies to like the fairy realm where she meets with the blue fairy. Remember all the fairies kind of know each other? The blue fairy warns Tink against helping Regina because the blue fairy thinks that the darkness has already taken hold of Regina and that Regina can't be helped. But Tink doesn't listen and she uses her magic to help Regina find her true love. The pixie dust, uh, I, I think she follows the pixie dust to a tavern where a bunch of men are drinking and it sort of lands on a man with a lion tattoo and that is allegedly Regina's true love. But Regina gets scared and she doesn't go talk to him. She runs away instead. Back in Neverland, Tink corners Regina and confronts Regina about how much she hates Regina. Then Tink knocks Regina out with poppy dust. Meanwhile, the heroes at this point had left Regina behind because Regina was being a pill and like was like, we're not getting Tink, she's not gonna help us, so Regina's on her own by now. But they do realize Tink had been tracking them, so they double back to find Regina. It's revealed that Tink doesn't have magic anymore, all because she helped Regina back in the Enchanted Forest. Regina implores that Tink pick love over anger and help them find Henry, instead of Tink killing Regina and becoming as evil as Regina. Tink actually agrees to kind of side with the good and forgive and forget, and she joins our heroes. Meanwhile, Pan is telling Henry that Henry needs to believe in magic so Henry can return magic to Neverland and the rest of the worlds. So allegedly that is Pan's plan. Because Henry has the heart of the truest believer, he can return magic to Neverland because apparently magic is leaving Neverland. And that's not good. And Henry, this appeals to Henry's, you know, want to be a hero. I mean, his grandparents are Prince Charming and Snow White. His mother is a curse breaker. His other mother is the evil queen. It's a lot but he does want to be a hero. Back in the Enchanted Forest in the past, Regina lies to Tink and says that the man with the lion tattoo wasn't her true love, that this man is actually evil and awful. And Tink realizes that Regina is lying and that Regina is refusing her help, which means Tink is in big trouble because when you're a fairy, you're supposed to help people. And she went behind the blue fairy's back, who is the main fairy of everyone. And Tink, didn't get anything out of it or Tink didn't help Regina. So when Tink goes back to the Blue Fairy, the Blue Fairy is mad and takes her powers away as she asserts that she no longer believes in Tink, which is bad. And so Tink is now powerless and normal and not a fairy. Back in the Enchanted Forest in the present, Neil, Mulan, and Robin begin their plan to get Neil to Neverland. They put three-year-old Roland into position by the window and when the shadow comes, Neil grabs onto it and is taken to Neverland. It works out really well actually. Um, afterwards, Robin asks Mulan if she would like to join the Band of Merry Men and Girl Boss says no because she has someone to talk to, to confess something to before she can do anything else. So Mulan goes to Aurora to talk to her, to confess something to her and begins to tell her something. But Aurora herself is actually bursting with news. Aurora's like, wait, like, let me go first. And she tells Mulan that her and Philip are expecting a baby. And we see Mulan's face just like drop. She has nothing else to say. So 
all she tells Aurora is that, oh, she decided to join Robin's band of merry men and leave. That's clearly not what she originally meant to say. Heavily, heavily implied that Mulan is in love with Aurora. Like, that is canon. Like, I know I was shipping them last video, but this is actually canon. Except, for, I mean, the fact that she walks away crying to go join the Merry Men, it's just, oh, it's such a heartbreaking scene. And then the way they treat Mulan also, another woman of color, by the way, is so, oh, it's so sad and it's just, I feel like I could make a video essay on why Mulan has the saddest, most undeserved character arc in all of Once Upon a Time and she's treated by the writer so badly. She's our first canonically lesbian or sapphic or woman-loving woman character. It's okay, sapphics don't always succeed. I'd know. <laughs> but it's just like, oh, when you look at it and you're like, why? So anyway, I'm gonna put a piece of love tape, but I'm gonna cry about it. You know, they really could be a thruple. Someone commented this last video. I feel like bisexuality's a curse. I know. So, sad ending for Mulan. And we're not gonna return to her story for at least another season and a half. And I hate to be the downer, but it's true. Mulan goes with the Merry Men. And guess who has a lion tattoo? Robin Hood. Which means Robin Hood is Regina's true love. I guess I'll, I guess that calls for some tape. Meanwhile, we see Neil land in Neverland and he is immediately taken hostage by the Lost Boys. Season 3, Episode 4, Nasty Habits. In Neverland, Neil is the hostage of the Lost Boys, but Neil quickly escapes because he's a girl boss. Meanwhile, Gold and Belle, the Vision Belle, are having another therapy session about how gold is metaphorically putting on the mask of a monster and I'm gonna throw up. It's repeated that Gold thinks he's gonna die if he saves Henry, but because of the prophecy, he's gotta do it, and he wants to save Henry and die himself so that he can redeem himself. Got it? Did you write that down? In the Enchanted Forest in the past, we flash back to Neil slash Balefire's childhood during the era where Rumpel is the Dark One. Bay clearly hates that Rumpel is so cruel to everyone. He can't have friends, he can't go outside because Rumpel has so many enemies. And Rumpel is quite overprotective of Bay. Back in Neverland, the heroes are planning their invasion of Pan's camp, but they don't have a way off the island. Pan controls who comes and goes from the island, so the fact that they don't know how to get out is bad. The only person who's ever left the island without Pan's permission is Neil. So Tink won't help them unless they have a plan off the island, so they have to find a plan off the island. But they think Neil's dead, so it's not like Neil can tell them how to get off the island. Though he is very much alive. They don't know that though. <laughs> Meanwhile, Gold is attempting to break into Pan's lair. In doing so, he runs right into Neil, who is attempting the same thing. Gold, again, thinking Neil is dead, thinks that Neil is a vision. Neil is like, no, I'm real. Like, put the spear down. Gold realizes it is, it is Neil, and he shares his plan that he's gonna die so that Henry can live, etc., etc. But Neil is like, no, 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 wait, there's another way. So he leads Gold to the ocean, where they summon a giant squid and spear it and reel it in. It's a lot, I know. Anyway, we have a giant squid, but we extract the squid ink, and the squid ink can immobilize a magical creature. If you remember details, if you're a detail-oriented oncer, squid ink is how Charming and Snow initially paralyzed Rumpelstiltskin in order to arrest him and throw him in the dungeon. That was a long time ago, so if you don't remember that, that's okay. Back in the Enchanted Forest in the past, Rumpel comes back to their cottage to find out that Bay has run away. Rumpel tracks Bay to a town where, under duress, remember, Rumpel doesn't do anything calmly, the villagers, the extras, reveal that there is a piper out there, the Pied Piper which is a, a fairy tale reference. I'm not sure if we understand that one. It's, it's kind of, it's a deep cut. The Piper lures children out of their beds with music and I guess kidnaps children. So Rumpel follows the children who are getting lured out of their beds to a bonfire in the woods. All these boys are dancing around it, wearing masks. It's giving cult, it's giving unwell. 
the piper is there too, and Rumple accosts the piper, who is none other than Peter Pan. He and Rumple again seem incredibly familiar with each other. Pan explains, and this is important, only boys who feel lost and unloved can hear the music of Pan's pipes. Rumple can hear the music. Bay can hear the music. Not looking well. So Pan reads Rumple for filth, because that's all anyone ever does. And he's like, you're worried that Bay will choose me and not you, because all anyone ever <laughs> all that anyone ever does is abandon you, like Mila and like your father. <laughs> so Lordy gosh, golly gee. Back in Neverland, Pan attempts to hypnotize Henry with his pipes, but Henry can't hear anything. So that's good, at least a win, a win for the heroes. Gold goes after Pan. He uses like a sleeping spell to make the Lost Boys and Henry all fall asleep. He faces off with Pan while Neil shoots Pan with a squid ink arrow and Pan catches the arrow as we've discussed before, but it's covered in squid ink, so he's immobilized. Neil and Gold grab Henry, but Pan gets the last word about the prophecy and how Gold is probably not going to sacrifice himself and his real plan is probably to kill Henry. And Gold is like, don't believe him, Balefire. You know he's a trickster, but, but Neil is like, you know, that guy's got a bad rap, so Pan could be right. Neil, and Neil believes Pan. So he immobilizes his father with squid ink and takes Henry and leaves. Remember, Henry's sleeping for all of this. Meanwhile, Hook shows the heroes Neil's hideout from the time from Neil's time in Neverland, hoping that they can figure out how to get off the island. They find a candle inside a coconut with holes. Do we understand? So a coconut is broken in half. It's got holes on the top. So if there was a candle lit, the holes would project onto the ceiling of the cave, the hideout, okay? It's like a nightlight. <laughs> it projects a nightlight of stars, or in our case, it's a map of stars, but it's only a map that Neil can read. Remember, they're still convinced Neil's dead. Um, in the Enchanted Forest in the past, Rumpel finds Bay and magically poofs him home. And Bay obviously does not believe that Rumpel was taking him back for his own good. And Rumpel explains like, no, 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 Pan's a bad guy. Like in the past, he betrayed me. Like we have bad blood. And Bay's kind of like, you have bad blood with everyone. And he makes the point that if Rumpel had just asked him to come home, he would have. But Rumpel didn't really believe Bale would come home on his own volition. So he poofed him home against Balefire's will. Back in Neverland, Neil and Henry get re-caught by Pan really fast. Like, really fast. They take Neil to the Neverland dungeon, which is like just these like cells made out of like bar wood and bamboo. I don't know. It's a whole thing. And Pan takes Henry back. H Henry slept through all of this and he wakes up and he's like, I had the weirdest dream that my father came and got me. But my father's dead, so that's not what happened. And Pan is like, yeah, so true. So true, bestie. Belle reappears to have another little therapy session about how now that Neil is back, Gold has something to live for, and now Gold no longer wants to die for Henry. Oh dear, oh dear. Back in the camp, when Pan plays Henry a tune on his pipes, Henry can now hear it. Hey everyone, so when I was editing, I lost two episodes worth of footage. So I'm going to recreate that for you now, um, puppetry style, which is fun. Um, and when I went to film this little ditty, my adapter for my microphone was not working. So the audio is going to be raw. So I hope whoever, the people who use this to sleep as a sleep podcast, I hope this doesn't disturb you too much. All right. Season 3A, episode 5, good form. So... The Lost Boys are dragging Neil away to Neverland Jail, which are just kind of wooden cages in the jungle. Meanwhile, back at Pan's camp, the Lost Boys are hazing Henry in a big way by making him sword fight. Pan helps Henry believe that he has magic by helping him to sort of tap into the magic of the heart of the truest believer, sort of proving that Henry has the heart of the truest believer. It's giving cult. It is giving indoctrination. I will not lie. 
Meanwhile, in Balefire's cave, our heroes, Snow, Emma, David, everyone, are trying to send a signal to Henry that they are coming for him and that they are going to save him. Snow is surprisingly the one to get the idea to trap one of the lost boys. Meanwhile, Hook and David are having a moment. David has noticed that Hook has been very interested in Emma, very invested in what she's up to. So put a pin in that, Hook seems a little bit interested in Emma romantically. Hook wants to swerve this conversation, and instead of acknowledging this, he points out the fact that David has been dying of dream shade. Hook is the only one who has noticed that David is actively dying. David, although the poison has spread a lot throughout his body, he wants to hide the fact that he is dying. Because David wants to hide the fact that he is dying from the others, these two decide to go on a side quest to retrieve Hook's brother's sextant that they had left at the top of a mountain. And this sextant will be used to decode Neil's star chart, the one that allegedly can help them get off Neverland. Who is Hook's brother and what is his sextant, you ask? Okay, I'm using one of the white boy princes because I can't find Hook's brother's picture, but he is on the board. We flash back to England? In the, like a, a naval ship in England at a time, at a time. Imagine like Victor like Victorian England or something. It's not specified, but we are in England. Hook or Killian at the time is a sailor in the Navy under the English King, and his brother is the captain of this ship. They're both pretty good sailors. They put a lot of stock into what they call good form. So good form is like acting like a good sailor, being honorable, all of this stuff. Their boat or their ship is sent on a mysterious mission to Neverland. They have a special sail made of Pegasus feathers that helps them sail to Neverland to retrieve what they believe is an antidote to a mysterious illness. Back in Neverland, Snow, Emma, and Regina manage to trap one of the lost boys. They're trying to get him to talk so that they can send a message to Henry, essentially. Regina wants to rip his heart out and just use his heart to send a message to Henry. Remember, if you have someone's heart, you can control them, you can control what they say. Snow obviously doesn't want this, so it's kind of a moral conundrum in which Emma is stuck in the middle. Emma interestingly sides with Regina to rip the boy's heart out and use the heart to send a message to Henry, which angers Snow because Snow always wants to be doing the morally good thing, whereas Emma is becoming a lot more morally gray and there's a lot of parallels between Emma and Regina. Q Sappho, Q girl in red, Q girl in red. Because Emma and Regina will do whatever it takes to get Henry back. Meanwhile, Pan intercepts Hook and wants Hook to come and work for him. So apparently they used to work together back when Hook lived on the island full time, back when Hook was sort of like trapped on the island. And Hook like readily accepts the deal in a way to work for Pan and sort of double cross, you know, Charming and Snow and everyone. But David or Charming overhears this conversation and he's like, Hook, why would you double cross us? And Hook immediately backtracks and he's like, no, I was just saying that to like, get him off our back. Like I was just lying to Pan. So that's one of Hook's more hilarious moments. It's an immediate turnaround to be like, nah, I was just trying to trick him. Like I got your back, you know, the bromance, the bromance is, is a Bruin. But at the top of the mountain, Hook reveals that his brother didn't actually lose his sextant. The sextant was just sort of a diversion to get David to the top of this mountain. Hook had lied so that David would go to the top of the mountain and find the cure for dream shade, which is the poison he's dying of. Back in Neverland in the past, Hook and his brother arrive in Neverland and they meet Pan. They tell Pan that they're looking for dream shade, which is the plant that can cure any illness, the antidote that the king sent them to look for. Pan reveals that dream shade is not an antidote to anything, it's actually just a poison. So this is kind of the realization that Hook and his brother were sent to find a poison for the King of England, and the King will then use it to, you know, commit war crimes and treachery and warmongering and stuff like that. So they were tricked by their government, which, you know what, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past England. I wouldn't put it past him. Hook wants to forget all about the mission. He is very upset that the king essentially tricked them. I, yeah, fair. But the brother is still loyal to the king and he's like, no, 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 Pan is the one who's lying. The king has to be right. So his brother scratches himself with dream shade, takes the plant, scratches himself. And is like, look, Killian, like everything's fine. We'll be fine. 
But then his brother immediately keels over and starts to die. Pan rolls up and reveals that there actually is a cure for the dream shade, and it is a sort of fountain of youth at the top of a mountain on Neverland. But he warns them that magic always comes with a price. Killian and his brother, well, more like Killian, are willing to pay the price. So Killian brings his brother and has him drink the magical fountain of youth. On the way off the island, they're looking for Pan because they're kind of like, we have to pay the price, right? Like they kind of think it's an exact exchange rate. Like they're gonna find Pan and like Pan's gonna be at the cash register. Like it's $12.99 to live. But that is not how it works. So they can't find Pan. They're like, I guess we don't have to pay the price. And so they get on the boat home. Back in Neverland, through the Lost Boy, Regina, Snow, and Emma deliver a message to Henry, basically saying like, we're coming, we're gonna get you, like hang in there, don't give in to whatever Pan is telling you, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, Hook and David are finding this fountain of youth, fountain of healing that he had previously used on his brother. But at this point in time, Hook knows what the price is. Whatever happened with his brother has taught Hook the price. And the price is that David can never leave Neverland. But David knows he has to stay alive in order to save Henry and at least live through that. He drinks from the fountain because it means he will help save Henry and after that they will just deal with the consequences and he will say goodbye to everyone and stay on Neverland forever. So, conundrums all around. They return to camp pretending all is well. Hook is the only one who knows David can't actually leave the island. So, as I mentioned earlier, Hook is really into Emma and honestly, they've been kind of flirty flirty for a hot minute now. And as a thank you for saving her father, Emma kisses Hook, but she's like, this is very much a one-time thing. Like, this is not gonna happen again, but they do kiss. And I do put the pink tape. You'll see the pink tape up when you get Ava, who is on the board, back to the board. Back in the past, Hook and his brother have gotten back on their ship and they think everything is well. But when they leave Neverland, the brother keels over and starts to die. So he dies because you can't drink the water and then leave Neverland. That's the price that they paid. Killian is very, very upset by this and he exposes the king to the rest of his crew. So he's like, the king sent us to get what he thought was a healing flower potion type thing, but really was a poison to, you know, start war and just commit war crimes. So he exposes the king and the crew is riled up because the crew loved Hook's brother. And so they revolt against the king and they set out to become pirates. And that is how Killian Jones becomes a pirate. Back in Neverland, remember when Pan tried to get Hook to his side real, real fast? Well, Pan realized Hook was lying that about working for him. And so in order to antagonize Hook, he tells Hook that Neil is actually alive and on Neverland. And Pan leaves it up to Hook to tell Emma that Neil is alive because he knows that this will cause Hook emotional distress. And if Hook tells Emma, it will cause her emotional distress, and get in the way of Hook and Emma from being together. Season three, episode six, Ariel. This is one of my favorite episodes and you will find out why. In the enchanted forest in the past, Snow is running from the evil queen's guards. So this is in the era where Snow is a fugitive bandit and Regina is after her because she just doesn't like Snow. This is when Snow has run away from the castle and Regina wants to catch Snow and kill her and all this stuff. The Queen's guards, the evil Queen's guards, run Snow up to a cliff and they're like, haha, Snow White, you have nowhere to go. You're coming with us. But Snow, instead of going with the evil Queen's guards, jumps off the cliff and lands in the ocean. She passes out and, you know, we would think she's dead, except someone comes to save her. My favorite princess, Ariel, comes to save Snow White, and that is why the episode's name is Ariel, because it's all about her. And even though my mermaid videos on TikTok might be kind of flopping, I still love mermaids, and I have always loved mermaids, and I love Ariel. So I'm super excited for this episode, one of my favorite episodes. Back in Neverland, Regina is attempting to teach Emma how to harness her magic. So remember, because Emma is the savior, she has magic. But the only time she can get it to work is when she's very angry. And it's very dangerous in this world to have magic that is, is fueled by anger. Regina's is very much fueled by anger, but Emma doesn't want hers to be. Meanwhile, Hook tells Snow and David that Neil is on the island and he doesn't know what to do. They sort of agree to keep this from Emma because they know it'll 
sort of make her veer off the path of finding Henry. It'll cause her emotional distress, all of these things. So just remember that they're trying to keep it a secret for now. Back in the Enchanted Forest, Snow and Ariel are bonding over being two Disney princesses who are going through things in their life. And Ariel reveals to Snow that she has fallen in love with a human. And he is not just a human, but he's a prince. He's a land prince. And Snow encourages Ariel to go after this prince to find her true love. In order to do this, they attend a ball that Prince Eric is throwing on land. The ball is in honor of the sea goddess Ursula, so it's sort of to like honor her and all that. And so luckily, even though Ariel's a mermaid, the sort of gift that all the mermaids are given is that they get to have legs for 12 hours at a time at night. So she gets her legs and then Snow and Ariel go attend the ball. Back in Neverland, you know how these two have decided to keep the fact that Neil's alive a secret from Emma. Well, Snow can't keep a secret, so Snow blurts out that Neil is alive and Emma is shocked, understandably. Regina does not believe that this tomfoolery is happening. She's, she's over it. She does not want to go on a side quest to find Neil, so she leaves on her own to go find Henry on her own. Meanwhile, Pan has been harassing Mr. Gold this entire time just sort of tormenting him because Gold is off on his own right now. So just sort of being like, you know, you should just give up, go back to Storybrooke, give up on Henry, like go hang out with Belle. Like Pan knows who Belle is. He's like, you and Belle should have a kid and forget all about Bellfire or Neil. Weird, weird thing to say, but he says it anyway. Back in the Enchanted Forest, Ariel and Eric dance at the ball. And how they met was Ariel had saved Eric from a shipwreck. So Eric, thinks he recognizes her from the shipwreck because she's the one that saved him. He thinks that it's the sea goddess Ursula who'd saved him from the shipwreck, but Ursula showed him the, a vision of his true love, which is Ariel, which is not completely true. Ariel was sort of just the one who saved him, but you know what? To each their own, they believe that they are destined to be together. He reveals that he is going on a trip to see the world, just see what's out there, and he wants her to come. The problem is she's a mermaid and Eric doesn't know that. So she is just sort of worried and like wanting to go on this adventure tour, but not able to. I don't know why she couldn't just like swim alongside his boat or whatever, but it's a problem, it's a problem. Meanwhile, evil queen Regina is watching Snow through the mirrors. Remember, Regina is doing everything in her power at this moment in time to trap Snow and bring her to justice. So she, we see her sort of form a plan in her head. Ariel goes out to the sea to think about this conundrum, like, what can I do? Do I give up on my true love? Do I tell him I'm a mermaid? All of this stuff. When who shows up but the sea goddess Ursula? Here's the thing. The sea goddess Ursula looks exactly like evil queen Regina. So we know, the audience knows that it's evil queen Regina in disguise as the sea goddess Ursula, but Ariel doesn't know who the evil queen is. She's never met Regina. So she leg legitimately thinks that this is Ursula. Ursula slash Regina gives Ariel an option to have legs. In order to have legs, she must trade her tail with someone else. Keep that in mind. Back in Neverland, Vision Belle, remember she's sort of like a vision right now, is talking to Rumpel. Gold is like, I'm really thinking of just going back home to you, Belle. Like, I, I'm thinking about what Pan said, and I really don't want to go after Henry and sacrifice my life for him, etc., etc. And Belle's like, that, that sounds great. Just take my hand and we can go back. And as Gold is about to take Belle's hand, Regina appears and starts choking Belle. Regina is like choking Belle and she's like, are you really going to fall for this? And Gold is like, what are you doing? That's my emotional support vision. <laughs> when Belle dies, she transforms into Pan's shadow. So instead of a, a vision, an emotional support vision, this Fake Belle has been Pan's shadow this entire time. Awesome. Regina has the funniest line in the whole season. She has great lines this season, but she looks at him and she's like, what are you doing? This is not amateur hour. Like Gold should have known that this was a trick. This is too good to be true. Regina and Gold decide to team up to get Henry on their own. So now we have a couple different groups trying to get to Henry. And Gold is still really hesitant because this idea that he would sacrifice himself for Henry's life comes from the idea that he has to kill Pan and in killing Pan, he will also die. So they're trying to avoid this. 
they're kind of being selfish now. They don't want to kill Pan and they don't want to have Rumple die. At least he doesn't want this. So they come up with an idea to, instead of killing Pan, try and trap him. There is something in Storybrooke that will help them trap Pan instead of killing him. Back in the Enchanted Forest, Ariel runs to Snow and she's like, Snow, I have a great way for you to escape the Evil Queen and for me to get my legs. And Snow's like, that's great. Regina slash Ursula had given Ariel a bracelet and whoever puts the bracelet on will get a tail and Ariel will get legs. So Ariel puts the bracelet on Snow and Snow transforms into a mermaid and Ariel can stay human. Snow is skeptical of this because first of all, she doesn't really want to be a mermaid. And then Regina rolls up, Regina as the evil queen, and is like, hey, now you're incapacitated because you have a mermaid tail and I can kidnap you. And that's when Ariel realizes that she messed up. Ariel's really upset by this, obviously. And Regina delivers an iconic line. You went to a long dead octopus for advice and you're going to blame me for your problems? Iconic, she's an icon. Just as Regina goes to take snow, Ariel stabs Regina with a fork or a dingle hopper. Ariel takes the bracelet off snow, transforms herself into a mermaid and swims them both away to safety. Back in Neverland, the heroes are now on a side quest trying to find Neil because he's alive, they have to go find him. They track him to a place called Echo Cave, and Neil is in a cage in the middle of the cave on a sort of island. There's no way across unless you state your deepest secret. Of course, of course, of course. So Hook is like, I guess I'll start with the secrets. Um, my secret is that I'm in love with Emma and I've been in love with her this entire time. Icon legend. And then a sort of uh, a rock path starts to form across the big cavern to get to Neil. Snow goes next. Her, her secret is that she loves Emma. She loves, she loves Emma so much, but she can't shake the desire to have another child. So obviously these secrets are coming as a shock to everyone. That's not great. This is not exciting, but the rock bridge continues to form. Then David is like, actually, we can't have another baby because I drank magical water and I have to stay on this island forever. And I didn't tell anyone besides the guy that is in love with my daughter. The rock bridge keeps going. Everyone's upset, but that's enough for Emma to cross and get to the cage that Neil is in. She can't get the cage open, which means that she has to say a secret of her own. She confesses that when she found out that Neil was alive, she was terrified. Because she's still in love with him, she was secretly hoping that he was actually dead because it would be easier to put him behind than face losing him again. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Anyway. Okay. The cage breaks and he hugs her anyway, even though she low-key wishes he was dead. And you know what? Neil is saved. Thank goodness. Back in the Enchanted Forest, Ariel saves Snow and... Snow is like, you know what, after all this, it's okay. Everybody makes mistakes, everybody has those days. What you need to do now is go tell Eric that you're in love with him. Just tell him the truth, tell him you're a mermaid. None of this like secrets with Ursula, none of this, all of that stuff. Ariel swims to the castle, to Eric's castle, and he's out there looking for her. When she calls out to him, when she goes to say something, she no longer has a voice. Regina appears and reminds Ariel that all magic comes with a price. And because Ariel didn't go through on their deal, essentially, she no longer has a voice. Regina has stolen her voice, which is very, very Little Mermaid. Then Regina goes home. She hasn't gotten snow, but you know, at least she has another thing in her arsenal. She has Ariel's voice. She can sort of like control Ariel in a way. And when she goes to sort of talk to her magic mirror, it's not necessarily Sydney Glass in the mirror, but it's the real Ursula. The real Ursula is in the mirror and is really mad that Regina has impersonated her and basically threatens Regina never to impersonate her again. This won't come into play for another few seasons, but just know Ursula is actually real and is very mad that Regina impersonated her. Back in Neverland, remember, Gold and Regina have made their own team. And Regina is like, I know someone I can send to Storybrooke to get this thing that'll trap Pan. She goes to the coast and summons Ariel. Apparently, mermaids can travel across realms. So Regina says to Ariel, basically, I will give you your voice back if you go to Storybrooke 
and get this thing in Gold's shop. And to sweeten the deal, she reveals that none other than Prince Eric is in Storybrooke. So if Ariel goes and does this errand, she gets her voice and Eric. Season three, episode seven, Dark Hollow. So this is one of my favorite episodes and you're about to see why. We flash back to Storybrooke. So we have gone back to Storybrooke. We haven't seen Storybrooke this entire season. It's almost episode seven. Now, so we see, this is in Storybrooke five days ago, which is right after our heroes left on the Jolly Roger. So this has left Belle to explain to all of the Storybrooke citizens the situation of Henry's kidnapping um, and just explaining everything. Gold had given Belle a spell that will cloak Storybrooke from unwanted visitors, like accomplices of Greg and Tamara, for example. Speaking of, we see a convertible driving towards Storybrooke with two men in it. So the dwarves are essentially in a race in the mine to get enough fairy dust to activate this cloaking spell that Gold had given Belle um, before the unwanted visitors come to Storybrooke. Belle activates the spell and it forms a magic dome that envelops Storybrooke. Unfortunately, the convertible people make it into Storybrooke just as kind of the wall of magic is falling, so they get in. Back in Neverland, Gold and Regina instruct Ariel how to get through the cloaking spell, and Gold tells Ariel to find Belle, because Belle will know what to do. Meanwhile, Pan can sense that Ariel is leaving Neverland, so he needs to get a word to his people in Storybrooke that someone is coming to Storybrooke. So he needs to get his minions to stop whatever Ariel's doing. And, you know, his minions are these two men right here. Meanwhile, Neil thinks, so Neil has been reunited with the heroes, and he thinks that the heroes can get off Neverland using Pan's shadow. They need to capture it. Luckily, Pan doesn't keep his shadow on him. In Storybrooke, Ariel has swum all the way and she meets Belle. This is why this is one of my favorite episodes, because Ariel and Belle are two of my favorite princesses, and I am a Disney princess girl through and through, and they are best friends, and they have to solve the mystery of what they need to get at Gold's shop. So Gold has sent a little sand dollar that does a projection a la, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope, but pretty much in this Princess Leia projection, Gold warns them that there are people coming to Storybrooke and that they need to find an object that is hidden with the strength of their love to, to, and send it back with Ariel to Neverland. What object could be hidden with the strength of their love? Easy money, we go to the chipped cup. Do you remember her? Do you remember her? The chipped cup opens a little door with a tesseract looking box. So the, it's not a tesseract, it's not Loki's tesseract. It's a Pandora's box from Greek mythology aka the box that contains the world's worst evil. If you've read Percy Jackson, you know that it comes into play. If you're familiar with Greek myths, pretty much if you open the box, it, it, I don't know. In this, in this context, it can contain the world's worst evil. I'm not even sure. I'm not sure. Don't stop asking. Don't look at me like that. Back in Neverland, Snow won't talk to Charming because she's mad he didn't tell her about not being able to leave the island. She's kind of like, you could have told me and I would have stayed on the island forever, in fact. So, we're also dealing with the fact that both Hook and Neil are deeply in love with Emma. Hook has revealed to Neil that he kissed Emma, a fact that Emma never shared with Neil, so it's awkward. They have to go to Dark Hollow. So we had the Dark for Jungle, we had Echo Cave, and now we're at Dark Hollow, okay? Are you writing this down? There's gonna be a test at the end. I'm just kidding, that's a joke. Don't freak out, don't freak out. Dark Hollow is the darkest spot on the island, blah, 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 blah. In reality, it's a green screen with overlaid red tint on from in post-production, I'm sure. That is where Pan's shadow is. Hook and Emma have a moment where he's like, if I win your heart, I'll win it fair and square. So like they are competing and Emma doesn't want anything to do with this love triangle uh, at the moment. She just wants her son back. Meanwhile, Pan is finding it hard to gentle parent Henry. So instead of, I don't know, being honest with him, which he's never done, but I'm just saying it could have been an option. He tricks Henry into following Felix 
and Felix kind of reveals on accident, like Henry's like trailing him, and Felix reveals, reveals this like treehouse, I suppose? Give it a minute, give it a minute. Back in Storybrooke, these two British men catch Ariel and Belle and take the box. Now Ariel and Belle are tied up and they are in danger. Unlike Greg and Tamara, these British men know exactly that they're working for Peter Pan. Luckily, Ariel and Belle escape and go after the, t I keep saying the Tesseract in the script, go after Pandora's box. They think that the British men are gonna try and destroy Pandora's box with a dwarf's pickaxe because that is the power of dwarf's pickaxes. They can destroy magical things. They find the British men and Belle's heroic move is to go, don't destroy it. People we know will die. And the British men are like, if we don't destroy it, people we know will die. The British boys are like, wait, we're only doing this because Peter Pan is holding our sister. And Belle tries to persuade them to defeat Pan and like join their side. So their sister's name is Wendy, which means these two boys are John and Michael Darling. So let's, let's do a bit of reconfiguration here for a sec. Okay, okay. Okay, we can do this, we can do this, we got this. So, I'm gonna put you up here, okay? Smee, okay, brother, okay, Smee. You're gonna go over here. And then Lost Boys. Oh my gosh, I should have been referencing Lost Boy by Ruth B this entire time. John and Michael Darling are Wendy Darling's brothers. This is Wendy in Once Upon a Time. Last season, I had put them, can you even see that? They've grown up, but she hasn't, and they, okay, so Pan is like holding Wendy over their heads so that they do whatever Pan wants, got it? Okay, back in Neverland, we see Henry has followed Felix, now I'm confused where everyone is, Henry has followed Felix to this treehouse where Wendy is, and he meets Wendy, and Wendy is like, <laughs> I'm sick. So she's pretending to be sick and she's like, it's, it's the, the magic in Neverland is fading. So I'm gonna die. And only the heart of the truest believer can save me. <laughs> so Henry, this appeals more to his hero complex. So he's like, I will save you. Cool. And then when he leaves, Pan steps out of the shadows and is like, good job, Wendy. You're playing a good role. I don't know. Wendy's hand is being forced here. Emma, Hook, and Neil are in Dark Hollow trying to light the coconut candle. So the coconut candle can trap the shadow. I don't know why. I don't stop asking. Don't ask me why. It just does. So anyway, Hook and Neil are having like a pissing contest over who's going to light this candle because nobody can get the goddamn lighter to work. Um, and they get attacked by three shadows, not just one. So these two are like incapacitated and Emma remembers that she has magic. And so she uses magic to light the coconut candle and trap Pan's shadow. Ariel rolls up to Neverland and brings Pandora's box to gold. Regina grants Ariel the power to have legs whenever she wants. And Ariel passes along one last message that Belle wants them to save Wendy. Awesome. Season three, episode eight, Think Lovely Thoughts. In the Enchanted Forest, this con man on the street is like tricking people. You know the episode in Avatar The Last Airbender where like Toph and I can't remember, it might've been Toph and Aang who are like tricking people and playing the games and like with the rock under the cups and then you guess which cup the rock is under and then you lose your money because you've been tricked. That's what's happening here. He gets beat up by some random British people, I don't, guys, I don't know, because he keeps taking people's money and so then they're in like Victorian England or some, they're not in, they're in, I don't know. They, he gets beat up by some other villagers because he he's stealing people's money so these villagers steal the money back and this man is broke. And the man has a son and he's like, don't worry, we'll figure it out. Don't worry, little Rumpelstiltskin. So we meet Rumpel's father We are looking at Rumpel's childhood. 
Rumpel's father leaves little Rumpel to be raised by spinsters. He gives Rumpel a little doll, which is what we were seeing Rumpel having in the first few episodes. Um, the spinsters teach Rumpel how to spin. It's kind of an allusion to how later he'll spin straw into gold. Right now he's spinning straw. And they're like, you could make a lot of money selling your straw. I'm not really, I'm not a spinster, so. I mean, like at this, like at the rate my life is going, I might be a spinster eventually, but I'm not there yet, so. <laughs> um, okay, so they're like, you can make a lot of money with this, except no one's gonna hire you because everyone knows your father's a con man. So you should probably like ditch your father. And they give him another magic bean so that he can go wherever he wants. Back in Neverland, Gold and Regina meet the heroes outside of Pan's lair. So now we've all come back together and they present Pandora's box, which can contain Peter Pan. Neil reveals that he doesn't trust Rumpel because there's a prophecy that uh, Henry will be Rumpel's undoing. Essentially, Henry will kill Rumpel. Um, and he's like, Gold definitely wants to kill Henry, like he's not here to be trusted. So to prove he can be trusted, Gold gives Pandora's box to Neil. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, young Rumpel finds his father out gambling and he makes an offer and he's like, what if there was some place we could start over when no one knew you? Actually, okay, he's definitely not British. He makes the offer of, what if there was somewhere we could start over where no one knew you? Interestingly, that is exactly what Balefire is going to say to Rumpelstiltskin a generation later. Rumpel's father agrees, and he wants to travel to a place called Neverland that he's only seen in his dreams. So they open the portal with the bean and they go to Neverland. In Neverland in the present, Emma is trying to find a way to get Charming off of Neverland. Gold proposes that he can do it. He can make an elixir back in his shop so that David can leave Neverland and be cured, essentially. Like, he won't die because they'll have an elixir ready and they'll bring enough magic water from Neverland to keep him alive until the elixir's ready. And that plot line is settled. That's the end of that plot line. David doesn't die. Surpri not surprisingly, he is a main character. So, now it's finally time to ambush the camp. Tink is back. Rumple and Neil and everyone is back. They're all back. And Regina uses magic to knock out all of the Lost Boys. But Henry is nowhere to be found. Instead, they find Wendy. Neil recognizes Wendy. Remember, he spent some time with the Darling family back in season two, back when he was a young boy. She says that she had come back to save Balefire all those years ago, but she had gotten caught by Pan. They begin to ask Wendy if she's seen Henry, and she starts lying, saying that she's never seen him. But once, the, once she makes the connection that John and Michael are working with them and working to get her uh, free, um, she begins to tell the truth. Wendy reveals that the idea that Pan needs Henry's heart to save magic is actually a lie. Pan really needs it to save himself. So Pan's been telling everyone this entire time that the heart of the truest believer will save magic in Neverland and magic everywhere. Which is like also there's also a plot point in season two where henry tries to destroy magic and so like the lore behind magic is a lot so now henry wants to save it i mean he's only 11 remember it takes a village to raise a traumatized 11 year old so i understand the moral conundrum so pan is dying and he wants to absorb all of the magic in neverland so he can become immortal and to do that he needs henry's magical heart and that means Henry will die. Henry doesn't know this though. Traumatized 11 year old. Pan is taking Henry to Skull Rock to carry out this plan. Emma sends Snow and Charming to get magic water so they can uh, keep David alive until they get back to Storybrooke. Hook and Tink stay with the Lost Boys while Neil, Emma, Regina, and Gold go after Henry. In Neverland in the past, Rumpel and his father have landed and they are experimenting with the magic they can do. Essentially, if you can believe it, you can do it in Neverland. They are having the time of their lives. The father really wants to get pixie dust so he can learn how to fly. Rumpel doesn't necessarily want to fly, but he goes along with it anyway. Rumpel's father decides to climb a tree to get pixie dust, but when he's in the tree, he starts getting chased by a shadow. The shadow talks to him and he's like, I am the sole inhabitant of Neverland. Who are you? 
Rumble senses something is wrong, and for the moment his father is nowhere to be found. Back in Neverland in the present, at Skull Rock, Gold is the only one who can get into the cave because Pan designed magical wards so that only people without shadows can get in. And he remember, he doesn't have a shadow because he gave the Dark One Dagger to his shadow and cut his shadow off, whatever. So Neil is forced to give Pandora's box back to Gold. Regina and Emma, wanting to get in after Gold, <laughs> use their magic to block out the moon. Okay? Because apparently the moon is the only thing that causes shadows, so if they get rid of them... <laughs> this is reminding me of the time in 2020 where people were trying to curse the moon. Do you guys remember that on TikTok? Anyway. Okay. Okay. They block out the moon, even though there's torches everywhere that cast shadows. But you know what? I'm gonna let them have this one. I'm letting them have this one. So now everyone can get into Skull Rock. Hooray. In the past, Rumpel's father actually does come back and he's like, the pixie dust doesn't work on me because I'm not a child. So Rumpel's father says there is a way he can become a child so he can fly by letting go of the thing holding him back, which is his son. Father of the Year award does not go to this man. So with that, the shadow takes Rumpel and flies away. And with, so with, now that he doesn't have a son anymore, Rumpel's father transforms into his younger self, and Rumpel's father's younger self is a person we know all too well. Rumpel's father is Peter Pan. <laughs> the people who have seen this show, you know what conclusion we were coming to. You know the, the wildness of this. But the people who are watching this and have not seen Once Upon a Time, please, please tell me if you saw that coming. Did you see that coming? Did you? Okay. Okay, hold on. Can you see that? <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? Okay, it is 3.30 p.m. in winter in Michigan, which means it is golden hour, so... I don't know if the lighting's changed drastically, um, but I think you can still see the glory that is this family tree. <laughs> Peter Pan, Rumpelstiltskin's father. Important to note, <laughs> in, in a literary sense, it really informs our sense of really just wondering who our parents are and how they've made us the way that we are today. I'm just gonna keep going, okay. Rumpel, returns in tears to the spinsters. So he's now an orphan, I guess. Back in past Neverland, Peter Pan is now Peter Pan. And actually, he named himself after Rumpel's little doll. Rumpel's little doll's name was Peter Pan. And so now he's like, I shall call myself Peter Pan in honor of my son who I just abandoned. Then the shadow, okay, so in this past Peter Pan, I guess we can move the shadow up now. The shadow shows Peter this big hourglass. And so at the moment, the hourglass is pretty full at the top, but the shadow is like when the hourglass kind of empties, your power will die. Um, and this is where he has found out he needs the heart of the truest believer to save his own magic. He's been on an agenda since day one. Back in Neverland, Gold confronts Pan. It's starting to become clearer why they hate each other. In the room with us, we have four generations of uh, great-grandfathers, grandfathers, sons, and grandsons. So uh, Pan tries to convince Gold that he still cares about Gold, but Gold doesn't buy it. When Gold tries to use the box, Pan reveals that he had switched the boxes because he's still that trickster old man. Um, <laughs> I wrote trickster con man, but I said trickster old man, so that's just... Now I'm just being mean to the actors. So Pan's got the real box and traps Rumple in it. So that sucks. Oh no. <laughs> in front of the giant hourglass, Henry is about to sacrifice his heart. Remember, Henry thinks he's saving magic when he's really just saving Pan. Just as Henry goes to rip out his own heart, his parents, all three of them, all three of his parents, show up 
Henry is still convinced that he needs to save magic. Like they're kind of like, Henry, no, he's tricking you. But Henry's like, Pan would never lie to me. I don't know. So he rips out his own heart and shoves his heart into Pan's and it creates an evil burst of green light and Henry starts dying and Pan becomes all powerful. Season three, episode nine, Save Henry. This episode is exciting because we get to flash back to the original curse that sent everyone to Storybrooke. Uh, we're going back to our roots of this green, green, purple, purple. Oh, guys, my mom thinks I'm colorblind and I'm not, but like every day the allegations get stronger and stronger that I'm colorblind. We're going back to our roots, this purple curse. So in the enchanted forest, in the past, Grumpy is ringing a bell warning everyone that the curse is here, as if they don't see the mass purple smog rolling in. We see Regina visit Rumple in his jail cell so that she can gloat about how he's, where is he? He's about to lose his memories. And Rumple is like, how does it actually feel though to kill the thing you love most? So remember she had to kill her father, whose name was also Henry, in order to enact the dark curse. Okay, so Rumple reminds Regina that the child of Snow White and Prince Charming can still break the curse. Um, he also is like, and uh, one, one more thing, but there's um, a hole in your heart. And one day, you are going to come to me to fix it. That's what he says to Regina. In Storybrooke, 11 years later, we're in the midst of the Storybrooke curse. So nobody knows that they are fairy tale characters. Everyone thinks, she, Snow thinks she's Mary Margaret. Um, Gold thinks he's, Rumple thinks he's Mr. Gold. Um, only Regina remembers the original fairy tale land. Regina has called Archie to her office. Remember, Archie is the town therapist because she is not happy with her life. She's feeling nothing. Like the curse is doing what she wanted, but she's bored. And so Archie is like, well, you're kind of feeling a hole in your heart. I don't know why a therapist would say that, but you know what? He got his PhD from a curse. So um, Regina comes to the realization because she remembers um, loving, I think his name was Owen. She loved having Owen around. And she wants to adopt a child. So she goes to Gold and she's like, hey, adoption agency lines are years long and I want a child now. So he is sets out to procure a child for her. She, he matches her with a child and Regina, Regina is matched with a baby in Boston. So apparently, according to curse rules, only she's allowed to leave. So she goes to Boston and she meets the baby and she names him Henry. Back in Neverland, Regina, Neil, and Emma can't wake Henry up. Pan reveals that gold is in Pandora's box, so uh, Pan flies away. Henry is very much unconscious, like actively dying. All looks lost, but they think they can still kill Pan because they are the heroes and they can do it. Emma tries to convince the lost boys, where are they? There we go, to give them information on where Pan might be. She appeals to their common orphan experience and she says, we can give you a home in Storybrooke if you help us. And so the Lost Boys tell Emma that Pan uh, is, I don't remember, they just tell him where he is. It's not important. In Storybrooke, in the flashback, Regina now has baby Henry and she can't get him to stop crying. Dr. Whale, that man right there, is like, well, maybe it's something, like it's probably nothing, but like it could be something genetic. If you had the medical records of the birth mother, you might know. Well, but this was a closed adoption, which means that they don't have any information on who the mother is. But Regina, being kind of the sly mayor, evil queen, sends out Sydney, her reporter, best friend, hit con man, to go find the records. She's on the phone with Sydney, and she gives uh, uh, Henry to Mary Margaret for a minute to hold him while she's like, can you go steal the records of this birth mother? And Henry only ever stops crying when he's being held by Mary Margaret. Some crazy on the nose foreshadowing, I know. But it's still sad for Regina. I do feel for her. She's distressed, but eventually Henry stops crying. Regina receives the information about Henry's birth mother and realizes the birth mother was found in the woods outside of Storybrooke 18 years ago. You know what happened 18 years ago? The curse. So Regina is like, is Henry's birth mother the savior? So she goes to Gold, accusing him of purposefully bringing the savior's son into Storybrooke, but Gold doesn't know what she's talking about. Remember, Gold doesn't remember. Back in Neverland, 
Regina, Snow, and Emma go to Pan's hiding spot and they find Pandora's box. But it's a trap. Pan reveals to the others that Rumpel is his son. It's a long story. He um, ties, he like, they're magically tied to a tree. And this tree is magical. It is fueled by regret. So the more regret you have, the stronger it gets. Luckily, <laughs> Regina doesn't regret anything she's done because everything she's done has led her to her son, Henry. She breaks free. She rips Henry's heart out of Pan's chest and embarks to save Henry. In the storybook flashback, Regina attempts to return Henry to the adoption agency. So there's another family already lined up to take Henry because Regina doesn't think she can do it and she doesn't want the savior's son in Storybrook. But at the last minute, she has a motherhood moment with baby Henry and she decides that she does want to keep him. When Regina leaves, we see the family who wanted to adopt the baby was John and Michael, the British men. So even during Henry's infancy, Pan was trying to get to him and sending out his goons to get to him. Oh my gosh. So many layers are happening. Regina is still worried that the birth mother could come break the curse. Spoiler alert, that's what happens. She's so worried that she makes a potion for herself in order to forget the fact that Henry's birth mother is the savior. It's a little dramatic, but I guess it lines up with the continuity of season one, so I'll allow it. It just, it's convoluted, but I mean, this show only gets worse, so. Back in Neverland, aboard the Jolly Roger, Regina places Henry's heart in his chest and he lives. He embraces Emma and Regina, his mothers, and Regina and Henry bond, and it's so sweet because she's a mother and they are bonding and the family's back together. But jump scare, uh, Pan shows up and starts to threaten Henry. <laughs> Meanwhile, Neil has released gold from Pandora's box. Neil and Gold have a moment about how gold came back for Neil, and so they start to reconcile. I think, again, they've reconciled a couple times now. But Rumpel senses that Pan is aboard the ship, and Pan is trying to steal Henry's shadow and ripping it off of his body, and Gold traps Pan in Pandora's box. Anyway, after all this, the heroes use Pan's shadow as a sail so they can fly home from Neverland and get the hell out of there and they have the lost boys, all the people they rescued, Wendy, they go back to Storybrooke, Wendy gives Tinkerbell some pixie dust, write that down, it's important. On the way back, Henry goes to talk to Felix, who is the only lost boy who is still loyal to Pan. And Felix is like, don't talk to me, I'm still on Pan's side, and Henry's like, well, I know. So when Pan tried to take Henry's shadow, what he was really doing was switching bodies with Henry. So now Pan, is in Henry's body, and Henry is in Pan's body trapped in Pandora's box. It only gets worse from here. Season 3, Episode 10, The New Neverland. In Storybrooke, Ariel has returned to Storybrooke, and her best friend Belle helps her find Prince Eric, so they get their happy ending. He's a fisherman in a cute little sweater, and they reunite, and they kiss. Then they see the Jolly Roger fly in. Everyone's reunited. Wendy reunites with John and Michael. There's a cure for David's dream shade poisoning, so he's not gonna die. Uh, Neil reunites with Gold and Belle. Neil and Belle have a really sweet friendship that continues for a hot minute. They have a sweet friendship and I do appreciate it, despite all the bullshit that this man's pulled. I feel like Neil and Belle are always there for each other. And not in a weird romantic way. We don't, it does not become a circle, I promise. And Regina starts to get a lot of credit for all the heroism she's been doing. In the Enchanted Forest, in the past, we flash back to one of the first episodes we've ever seen. We flash back to Snow and Charming's wedding, where evil Queen Regina comes in and she's like, I am going to destroy your happiness, etc, etc. And then Charming throws the sword, but she disappears before it can hurt her. This was one of the first scenes in the show, very iconic. We then follow Snow and Charming after their wedding, as they're trying to figure out what to make of this threat that will destroy their happiness. Charming wants to show Regina that their happiness will not be destroyed by simply going on their honeymoon and living their best lives. So they decide to go to the Summer Palace. And at the Summer Palace, Snow thinks there's a weapon that can help them stop Regina. In Storybrooke, Pan, as Henry, gets Felix arrested so that he can kind of garner um, trust, I guess. So nobody su suspects that he's actually Pan. Um, then we see gold trap Pandora's box in the floorboards with magic and everyone is like don't worry Henry You will never ever see that box again. We will never see it pan again. We will never open that box ever again. So that's great 
As they do after defeating a villain, they have a party at Granny's. All the heroes go to Granny's diner and they have a party after they defeat the big bad guy. And a couple things happen. One, Emma gives Henry the storybook that we haven't seen for a while. And she's like, here you go, your favorite thing. And he doesn't seem to recognize it, which Emma finds odd. Meanwhile, Hook tells Neil that he is going to back off going after Emma. He's not going to go after Emma anymore so that Henry's parents can be together without, quote, a devilishly handsome pirate in the way. Neil goes, are you serious? And Hook is like, yeah, I am devilishly handsome. The Blue Fairy and Tink reunite, but because Tink doesn't believe in herself, Blue can't give Tink her wings back. Then Neil tries to ask Emma on a date to kind of start over now that things are calmer, and she is hesitant. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, Snow and Charming arrive at the Summer Palace. When Charming goes to like tack up the horses, Snow takes off her traveling cloak and she is in her battle gear. And she starts to run off to wherever and Charming stops her and he's like, I know you and I always know that you've got a plan. So where are you going? And I'm following you and helping you. Snow reveals that the palace servants used to talk about a monster in this area named Medusa. And they want to find Medusa so they can turn Regina into stone. So between Pandora's box, the Pegasus sail, and Medusa, we have a lot of Greek mythology references, which would make sense if 3B, season 3B, had anything to do with Greek mythology, but it doesn't. <laughs> if anything, Greek mythology doesn't come back until season five, so I don't know what the writers, like if they were rereading like Percy Jackson or something, or what was going on. Back in Storybrooke, uh, Pan as Henry convinces Emma to let him stay with Regina. Regina is overjoyed because joint custody between the evil queen and the savior. It's a good thing. Henry is reading the storybook, catching up on all the lore, and he discovers the existence of Regina's vault, her magic vault with all of the magic in it. And he is like, um, mom, is, can we go into your vault and use the magic to protect me from Pan? Sneaky, sneaky. And Regina's like, no, you'll be okay. You don't, you don't need to do that. Also, we see the shadow on the Jolly Roger escape the Jolly Roger, so the shadow's out and about. Meanwhile, Emma stands Neil up at their date and doesn't show up. Um, David goes after her and Emma's too worried about Henry to go on this date with Neil because she can tell he's acting really, really weird. David gives her a little father-daughter pep talk, pretty much saying even though so many bad things are happening, you have to also let the good things happen or else what is all this fighting for? You have to go on your date with Neil. You're allowed true love. You deserve true love. Meanwhile, <laughs> Hook tries to seduce Tink to get over Emma. I'm not even going to put a piece of tape up there. It like is such a non-plot. But they're interrupted by someone screaming. It's the Blue Fairy. And the shadow has come and it rips off her shadow and kills her. So she dies. Um, the shadow only takes orders from one person, Peter Pan, which means Peter Pan is some somehow, we, we don't know how, communicating with the shadow. To protect Henry, Regina takes him to her vault. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, Charming and Medusa enter Snow's lair. Snow tries to cut off Medusa's head, the sword melts, so they decide to give up on the whole idea of trying to get Medusa's head to turn Regina into stone, and they run for their lives. But then Charming is uh, turned to stone, so that's not good. And the only way to turn him back is to kill Medusa, but Medusa's immortal, so they can't kill her. Regina is watching from her evil queen network of mirrors that can spy on people and she's like, Snow, I didn't realize I could sit back and watch you destroy your own happiness. And Snow is like, oh, this is my fault. Like if I wasn't so caught up with getting rid of Regina, we could have enjoyed our honeymoon and my husband would be alive. But then Snow uses this mirror actually to turn Medusa into stone by like mirroring Medusa's own gaze back on her. And Charming comes back to life and Snow is like, I will not be so caught up in trying to kill Regina because it is a detriment to my well-being. <laughs> so that's good. Back in Storybrooke, Charming, Emma, and Snow run to Rumpelstiltskin. They need to open Pandora's box right now and figure out how the hell Pan is commanding his shadow. They decide to open the box over the town line. Over the town line, there is no magic. So Emma goes over there and she like has a gun so that like she... Pan won't have magic and then she has the upper hand because she has a weapon. Pan, aka Henry, is let out of the box and he's super confused. He's like, hold on, don't shoot me. 
I'm Henry, pay and switched our bodies. So as you know, when your body gets switched with someone else's, you have to do the thing where you're like, fine, tell me something that only the real Henry would know. And so Pan, aka Henry, is like, oh my gosh, what would the real Henry know? Um, the first time Emma and Henry connected, the first time we connected, on the castle playground, when Emma told Henry that she put him up for adoption to give him his best chance. And Henry's like, that is the first time we bonded. And Emma's like, you're right. So that's all it takes for them to believe that Pan, or that Henry is in Pan's body. And it's kind of funny to watch all the actors like embracing Pan's actor because they've just been trying to kill him the whole season, but it's how it goes sometimes. They have to find the real Pan and the real Pan has knocked Regina out with magic um, and stolen something. So Pan catches up with Felix. Pan in Henry's body catches up with Felix and is like, guess what I stole? I stole the dark curse. And he wants to enact the dark curse so that everyone forgets their memories. He wants everyone to forget their memories and he wants to rule Storybrooke and have it be the new Neverland. Season three, episode 11, going home. Storybrooke. So do we remember the well where all the curses come out. We've seen this well many, many times. It's just where all the curses, that's where they happen. Felix and Pan slash Henry are at the well, dropping the ingredients in one by one. But remember, what is the most important ingredient of the dark curse? You know it, you know it, you know it, you got it. Heart of the thing you love most. And Felix is like, you don't love anyone. And Pan is like, well, it doesn't have to be romantic love. It, it can actually be someone who has been very loyal and a very good friend, and someone who has never betrayed me before. And during this monologue, Felix is standing there like... <laughs> Pan rips out Felix's heart and kills him as an ingredient for the dark curse. Another one bites the dust. The heroes are panicked. Luckily, Gold knows how to stop this curse. See, the curse is on a scroll, and the curse can be undone by the person who last used the scroll, which is Regina. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. You have to keep going. You just have to grin and bear it, okay? They need to switch Pan and Henry's bodies. Okay, to do so, they need the Black Fairy's wand. Do you know who the Black Fairy is? No, we've never met the Black Fairy. She's not Maleficent in this, I don't think. In some versions of Sleeping Beauty, the Black Fairy is Maleficent, but We've never met the Black Fairy, but apparently off screen, the Blue Fairy has killed the Black Fairy and has the wand, but the Blue Fairy's dead, so that's not good. In Neverland in the past, okay, this episode we get random little flashbacks. Smee, remember him? Hook's right hand man and Hook are traveling through Neverland and they're trying to find a way off the island. They get attacked by Tink. This was a while ago, this was a while ago. Who was like, who are you and why are you here? Hook immediately knows she's a disgraced fairy or used to be a fairy, and he says he's looking for magic. So this doesn't give us much other than like some context that Hook and Tink knew each other, so that's good. Back in Storybrooke, the heroes roll up to Mother Superior slash the Blue Fairy's funeral at the convent. Remember, in Storybrooke, the fairies are nuns. So at this open casket funeral, uh, their attack, uh, Pan's shadow comes to attack. So they grab the wand, the, he the heroes do. The shadow is too high to try and trap it with the coconut, but guess who has pixie dust? Tink. So Tink believes in herself, she believes in fairies, and she flies up and she traps the shadow that has been flying in the convent rafters. So now they have the shadow trapped and they have the black fairy's wand, so this is great. In the Enchanted Forest in the past, the blue fairy, Snow, and Regina and Charming are preparing to have, are preparing the magic wardrobe to get baby Emma to survive the curse. Do we remember this? Snow is worried about how Emma will know she's the savior, and the Blue Fairy simply says they have to have hope. In Storybrooke in the past, in 2011, I told you there's so many flashbacks in this episode and I'm confused. I'm confused as to how to get the message across to you. Basically, during the curse, before the curse is broken, Henry is in his depressed era. He is noticing that everything is kind of the same every day and he doesn't think his mother loves him. Snow, or Mary Margaret at the time, gives Henry the storybook to give him some hope because he's a lost little boy. He's not doing well, he's unwell, he's deeply unwell. In Storybrooke in the current <laughs> present, Gold uses the cuff that Greg and Tamara used on Regina a long time ago 
to block Pan's power as well, Henry and Pan's body. They use the Black Fairy's wand to switch the bodies back. They reunite with the real Henry, and when Regina goes to destroy the scroll that has the original curse on it, she passes out. Meanwhile, powerless Pan and Gold are having a heart-to-heart, -heart and basically is like, Pan is like, I never wanted a son. And then Pan takes off the cuff, because uh, Pan was the one that made the cuff for Greg and Tamara to use on Regina, so that was kind of an L for Gold there. He puts the cuff on Gold, and then what does he, does he, oh, he starts beating him up and calling him a coward. Nobody gets creative with their insults for Rumpelstiltskin, but... In the Enchanted Forest in the past, Rumpel is in his Dark One era, and Belle is in her Servant at the Castle era. Okay, so Rumpel is lighting a candle to remember Balefire, and Belle overhears him doing this, praying, mumbling. Who does the Dark One pray to? I don't know, that's irrelevant. She's like, oh, sorry, I didn't know you were here. And then he's quite rude back. And she's like, I'm so sorry. This was a remembrance, wasn't it? How old would he be? <laughs> and Rumpel opens up a little about how his son's not dead, he's just lost. And Bella's like, well, maybe it's not too late to find him again. It's a sweet moment, Belle being an icon, as per usual. Okay, back in Storybrooke. Regina's passed out, but it's okay, because she wakes up and she knows exactly how to defeat Pan and stop the curse. Pan returns with his full powers, and he is set out to kill everyone that Gold loves. Awesome dad of the year. Gold intercepts Pan and announces that he is going to um, give himself up to save Neil and Belle. Gold then summons his own shadow, which brings him the Dark One dagger. Remember, the shadow had the dagger the whole time. Gold uh, embraces <laughs> Pan and stabs them both through with the Dark One dagger. Pan transforms into the actor that plays uh, the older father version, and both Gold and Pan die. But that, that still leaves the curse. The curse is still coming. <laughs> Regina seems quite shell-shocked because she has figured out what she needs to do, and Emma's like, what is the price to pay? Regina says that she has to say goodbye to the thing she loves most, Henry. It also means that Storybrooke will be destroyed and everyone except Henry and Emma will go back to the Enchanted Forest. Emma, as the savior, can escape with Henry, but she'll have to leave her family. We flash back to Phoenix, Arizona, 11 years ago, where Emma is giving birth to Henry. Once again, we see her not want to hold Henry or look at him or keep him. Then in Storybrooke, we see Emma and Henry saying goodbye to everyone as they prepare to leave. Remember, it's the only way to survive the curse. Everyone's preparing to go back to the Enchanted Forest, essentially, because when Storybrooke's destroyed, everyone will go back except for Emma and Henry because they weren't born there. Regina says goodbye to Emma, and she reveals that Emma and Henry will also forget everything, but Regina gives Emma and Henry the gift of memories that they would have had together if Emma had raised Henry, so kind of a fake narrative where Emma did raise Henry and he was never adopted by Regina. The curse closes in, taking all of the fairy tale characters back to the Enchanted Forest, while Emma and Henry drive over the town line and leave Storybrooke. We then flash back again to Phoenix, Arizona. Emma gives birth to Henry, and the timeline changes, and she actually does want to hold him, and she eventually does end up raising him. One year later, we are in New York. Emma wakes up and she makes breakfast for Henry. They live in a beautiful apartment. They don't remember anything about Storybrooke or fairy tales or anything like that. Um, they're having a lovely little morning with pancakes and hot chocolate with cinnamon. And someone knocks on the door. It's Hook. What? Didn't he go back to the Enchanted Forest? What? He says he needs Emma's help. Her family is in trouble and she doesn't remember anything. And she's like, first of all, my only family's Henry. What are you talking about? And he's like, wait, I can help you remember. So he kisses her, but she's um, normal. And uh, she needs him in the groin because what the hell is going on? And she shuts the door on him and goes back inside. And that is the end of season 3A. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I always have a lot of fun making these and I really want to do season 3B. I just have so much fun. My next side quest before I can make season 3B is I'm taking a month long course at Oxford University in the UK, which is very exciting. So after Oxford, I will be doing season 3B. 
All right. Thank you guys so much. Um, and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye now.